Welcome to Stand Up for Doctors. I'm your host, Kim Downey. Thank you very much for joining us. I'd like to welcome Dr. Bryce Bowers. Thanks for joining us today, Bryce. Hi, Kim. How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm great. It's oh. 40 degrees and somewhat sunny in Michigan, so we're we're living large. Oh, now that's good. Now we're expecting a big snowstorm tomorrow. How about not you? Yeah, no, but that'll come in like mid-April when we're ready to be oh, over. Yeah, with, you know, exactly. Winter, so <laughs> it's coming. At least it's expected now. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, I usually start by saying how we met. So back on October 15th, uh, you sent me a message and you thanked me for sharing my most recent post where um, I had spotlighted physicians who have struggled and were courageous enough to share their stories. And you said there was so much you could relate to and that you loved reading articles like that, that they inspired you. And you talked about uh, getting some coaching yourself and how you started your blog, uh, Badge of Burnout about sharing your story and how you've battled uh, burnout during your career. And you said, if there's any other opportunities, like the one I posted or participating in a podcast or anything similar, you'd be happy to share. So then we said, let's do it, right? And then we collaborated on an article with uh, Dr. Beirouz Baybad, Why Write Physicians Share Their Stories of Healing Through Writing, which uh, Kevin Publ MD published uh, December 9th. And then he just published our uh, podcast about that. I think a week ago, Monday, Sunday, Monday, right? About a week yeah. ago. Yeah. And uh, now here we are, right? So we've done the podcast, uh, a couple podcasts, an article, and <laughs> maybe more to come, right? <laughs> yeah, it's been a whirlwind, but it, it it's happened so fast. I can't even believe it. But yeah, here, I mean, it's mid, well, we're like mid-February. And I, I feel like I've known you forever, but I haven't, you know? Yeah, right. It was just we didn't even communicate till the middle of October. So that's yeah. really something. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, by way of introducing you a bit more formally, <clears throat> Dr. Bryce Bowers is a family physician and founder of Badge of Burnout, a website dedicated to understanding why physicians and healthcare workers are experiencing burnout and how they can overcome it. A passionate physician wellness and mental health advocate, Dr. Bauer spends most of his time writing articles and recording podcast episodes surrounding these topics and engaging with various individuals in this similar realm on different media platforms. A budding physician entrepreneur, Dr. Bowers is always looking for opportunities for speaking engagements where he enjoys sharing his story to help others and is also working on his book and becoming a physician coach. Dr. Bowers utilizes his prior experience as a military veteran and rural family physician to highlight his unique portfolio of skills and abilities. And uh, today we're going to basically see where the conversation takes us. But one suggestion to get started was we uh, might talk about a few lines taken from our collaborative Kevin MD article, where you said, we all have perspectives and experiences unlike anyone else in the entire world as physicians. It is so important to share these to help others who are struggling and remind each other that we're not alone. The right words at the right time are the perfect melody. Share yours with the world. And I thought that was just beautiful. Um, so some people listening uh, won't have met you yet. Uh, so what would you like our audience to know about you as we begin our conversation? Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I really, I, I want, you know, everything to kind of not be about me and, and, and to kind of be about everybody else. Right. And, and how I can help them. I think that's kind of what it comes down to, you know, um, I, I don't want to say I'm just like a regular average person, but you know, like I, I kind of am. And I, I, I mean, I, things are going well for me and I'm really growing in this space and I'm having a ton of fun doing it and meeting extremely cool people like yourself. But like, ultimately, you know, my, my end game is to help people and, and bring awareness. And I, I want to use my story and my, my platform as a physician, um, to, you know, to do just that. Um, but ultimately, yeah, I, you know, I, I just want everyone to know that I, I on paper, if you knew me, you would think, well, this guy has it all together. And, you know, and I wrote a blog post about that when I was a resident in Southern California, you know, I was making six figures. I drove a sports car. I lived in San Diego. My life looked perfect on paper. And I was, you know, a physician and 
I mean, what could be wrong, you know, but everything was wrong. And, um, and so I, I guess I just want everyone to understand that, like, you know, when you look at someone, there's, there's always more than what, what meets the eye and, um, and everyone deserves so much compassion and, and understanding, you know, for what they're going through. And so I, I, I'm just, you know, I'm just somebody that I've been fortunate. I've been very lucky to, to be where I'm at now, um, and, and to have survived burnout and a lot of anxiety and depression and, and things like that. And, um, and so I, I just want to be somebody that people can relate with and connect with, you know, and if it's not me, I hope it's somebody else because, you know, I, I it doesn't matter if you're a physician, you know, a physical therapist like yourself, Kim, a nurse, you know, a, a health tech or a tech or anybody, us in healthcare, we are struggling. We really are. And, um, and I just want everyone to have courage, which is very difficult to come forward and say, look, my job is hard and it's wearing on me and I've got stuff going on at home too. And I really need some help here because I didn't do that. And it got me into a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And I wish I would have kind of saved myself some grief. So that's kind of the main driver of what I'm doing now is, you know, like, I, I just want everyone to avoid the heartache and heartbreak I did. Um, and, uh, and, and learn, you know, from my mistakes, basically. So yeah, well, thank you. Well, I've said before, and I'm not the first one to say that every time a physician shares their story, another physician feels left less alone. So it's really critical. Thank you for being willing, you know, to be vulnerable and to share your story, uh, to help other people, because it obviously will help people because, so many physicians say, um, you know, that they were walking around thinking they were the only one. And it's it's sad how many plus it's around the world. You yeah. know, I interviewed, I actually today, I just published uh, the episode I did with Dr. Simon Craig, who wrote From Hurting to Healing, a book about healing healthcare. And I joked around with him. I think I said it on uh, the podcast that other than ha the way he spells organization, because, you know, in Australia, they spell it with an <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know. Yep, yep. <laughs> I, I know exactly what you America, mean. In America, right? That it's <clears throat> that some of these issues are universal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's 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 certainly not unique. And and that was the thing, you know, when I was really struggling as an intern is like I did. I felt like I was the only person in the world that was feeling this way. And and I remember even to some degree feeling this way back in medical school and and I just never heard about burnout, nor had I heard a physician talk about it, you know, and if I had a colleague, one of my attendings, uh, you know, somebody just tell me, like, just to share a story, I'd be like, oh, my gosh, like, wow, I feel so much better. But I just never heard that. And that's no, that's nobody's fault other than that. Again, that's what's motivating me is just like, I'm, I'm trying to change this narrative of we've, you know, of kind of not saying how we feel and shielding ourselves and, and just pretending that we're okay when we're really not. And because I think if I would have heard, you know, now I'm connected in all this space and it's great. I've met all these great people, but like, if I would have heard some of these people's stories, I think I would have been a lot better off, you know? Right. Right. Absolutely. And I know someone, um, whose son is in uh residency right now. And, um, she's told me that when he was in medical school, that they did have lectures where they were talking about physician suicide. So that got a little maybe scary to him, but it didn't sound like then they um, had productive discussions about it or topics surrounding burnout and signs to look for and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's super interesting because, you know, and burnout has been around for a while, but it's kind of like the sexy new topic and physician wellness and stuff. And, and I think, I mean, it's not so black and white. I think some places are doing it right. And some places are doing it wrong, you know? And so, and I don't really blame, you know, I love my medical school and I'm very grateful for the training and education I got, but I don't remember us talking about anything about like mental health, anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. burnout, anything of that physician suicide, you know, I just, I had no idea. I just thought that waiting at the end of the tunnel for me after medical school and residency was this big paycheck, a lot of prestige and boom, you know, I was going to be okay. But so, you know, and, and now it's like, you know, in med school, med school, I review like the pulmonary system, like four or five times at least, mm -hmm. you know, per semester. Right. But like, you'll get like an hour of education about burnout or, you know, physician suicide. And it's like, there's an argument that, well, there's just no time, but my argument is there's no time to not put it in. You know what I mean? Because, 
you know, I think there's like, there's data out there, pretty good data that like 75% of med students are feeling burnout and, and having thoughts of suicide and, and these things. And, you know, and it's just completely unacceptable. I mean, even the physician suicide rate three to 400, you know, per year, that's about one a day, depending on where you put that metric. And it's just, it's unacceptable. You know what I mean? So it's obviously a problem. And, um, and where do you fix the problem? You go to the source is starting early on in training, because if if we don't normalize this conversation and these feelings and, and where we're at, it's this, nothing's going to change, unfortunately. Right. No, absolutely. There absolutely does have to be more information about the share during your early medical training. And um, one thing that I shared um, in about my episode with Dr. Simon Craig is when we were talking about um, uh, physicians, but this again is true. It was physical therapy school. Like we weren't taught at all. It says, it says, you, you know, you're taught to suppress your emotions, right? Which is, uh, you know, important if you're facing an emergency, but not so important for the rest of your life, right? So Simon and I had talked a little bit about that. And it's true that you're never taught, you just like everybody thinks that, um, oh, because you're a healthcare professional that you're just supposed to like deal with it, you know? So if yeah. you walk in a room and one patient you find out they died and you're like, you know, sad or upset about it because, you know, you work with these patients very closely yeah. and, but then you just know, okay, well, what you're supposed to do is like walk into the next room and say, you know, like, hi, I'm Dr. Bowers. I'm, you know, with a smile on your face or hi, I'm Kim Downey. I'm your physical therapist today. Yeah. Yeah. And even among my best friends, we never talked about that. And it's just, it, it just, you know, you keep it inside you all the time. So no medical, it doesn't seem like any medical training really has discussions around that. No, um, you know, and I think, again, I, I think that narrative is starting to change a little bit, but I, and I wrote a blog post about this, about, you know, in my, in medical school, I, in my, I think it was my fourth year and I was, you know, there was this young lady, she was 16 and she came in and she was, you know, but she was not alive and we brought her to the trauma room and I'm standing over her doing chest compressions and, you know, and I'm rotating in and out doing chest compressions. I put an IO line in her leg and all this stuff. And it's all happening so fast, you know, and I'm like, you know, I'm just, I'm young and I'm just like, Whoa, what's yeah. going on. And, and unfortunately she passed, you know, and, and then I, I walk out of the room, you know, I look back one more time at her and I walk out of the room and then there's my attending that I'm working with. He hands me a chart and he says, Hey, can you go please yeah, right. see room 16 or whatever? And, you know, I walk in the room and it's like some 12 year old kid. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, please, you know, let this not yeah. be anything like that, you know? And, but right. at the same time, I'm like shelving all that stuff. And, and so you're taught to do that and it desensitizes you. And, and at some point it becomes this kind of like cool thing that you're like, yeah, I can just go from mm -hmm. one room. And, 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 and that's something I think we have to change because whether or not we're aware of it, mm -hmm. those sorts of things are eroding at us and, and really, you know, etching away at our soul to, it's not normal to do that. And, mm -hmm. and um, whether or not it's playing out in some other form in your life, like substance use or, you know, anxiety and depression problems at home, you know, our job is extremely difficult and we see a lot of very heavy stuff and we have to learn to decompress from that. And that starts at an organizational level to say like, look, let's time out here and say, what just happened and how is everybody feeling? Right, right. One thing it makes me think of is I had a friend at a prior job and her husband, um, actually was a teacher at a corrections facility, but I think a high, it was like, um, with four youth, but who had committed serious crimes. So they've killed people, right? So he's like a math teacher or something, like in a room, you know, teaching people that literally killed other people. And I think there's a guard like either inside or outside the door, but you're always looking over your shoulder. So I think even in general, like corrections officers, police officers, you learn not to trust anybody. Then you bring that home. Mm -hmm. Right. And it affects your uh, personal relationships, like with family and friends. Yep. And it seems like the same could happen with physicians. And actually, and I've spoken with spouses of physicians, right, that when they come home, they just keep it all inside. And you might have a spouse waiting at home that would, you know, be willing to be a ear for you. Um, and then that doesn't happen. Yeah. And I, and I think that's the worst part is sometimes we don't recognize that sort of thing until it's too late, you know, and, and even if we do recognize it, 
we don't, we, we're so burned out and tired that we don't know what to do about it. You know, it's, I mean, I've recognized it several times. Like I'm talking to my mom on the phone and my mom, I love, you know, she's my best friend and, mm -hmm. and, and she's, but I'm like irritable. I'm short. I'm, I'm just, mm -hmm. and I recognize it, but I just, you know, I just had a horrible day at clinic and I, I it was so busy and, you know, patients were angry and I was behind and, and I'm just coming home and I just, I don't want to do anything. I don't mm -hmm. want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be around anybody. I, I don't, I don't want to, I just want to sit on the couch and numb out in some way. And, and not that that's the right thing to do because it isn't, but like, that's a lot of what of us, a lot of us are doing. We we're disengaging and we're trying to numb ourselves. And, and because of that, our relationships suffer. And then you get caught in this vicious cycle. Well, now my relationships suffer. So then, you know, you just keep numbing and numbing and trying to feel, and it, it's horrible. It's a vicious cycle. And I've been there so many times that, you know, that's, it's so complex. This whole issue is so complex and intricate. And that's, that's why I write a blog and do a podcast because it takes more than just one post. It takes more than one person. It takes, takes all of us to, and that's what you're going back to what you were talking about at the beginning is like, some people are like, well, I don't think my story is going to really help people. No, it is. I mean, there's, right. there's no person like you, there's no story like yours, you know? And so we need, we need these stories. We need these different perspectives because you have no idea whose life you could change by, by sharing those things. So I, I'm just, I'm all about it. Share it. You know, if, if you feel comfortable, of course, mm -hmm. you know, nobody wants to put you outside your comfort zone, but you right. know, I think saving a life or, or helping someone, that's what, what we're all here to do. So I encourage right. it. Right. And then, and of course, that this happens at any age, you know, what started happening with you is a medical student, but then even later career physicians, like in their sixties, like sadly, um, it can affect them. Cause you think, well, maybe they would have figured it out or, had it all together by them, but it could be the opposite that they've been, you know, suppressing so many things and it's just been building up and building up and building up. And I wonder if in some ways, the older you are, like if the walls you build are even thicker and if it gets even harder and harder to reach out. So I don't know if you even have any suggestions for like, say there's a physician listening and they've experienced the things you're experiencing um, how do you suggest actually reaching out or who to actually try to reach out to? Yeah, I think, you know, the, you make a great point. And I think it's, you know, some of those older guard physicians, um, that were raised in a very different time than like, even like my generation, you know, I'm 34 and, and, and those even younger than me, I, it, it's, it's good in the way that we we're trying to normalize this conversation around even mental health. You know what I mean? But like a physician who trained in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even the 90s, that just wasn't a thing, you know, like there's much more of this old guard, you know, we didn't have a work hour restriction and mm -hmm. we just sucked it up and did it. But, you know, unfortunately, those, those same, I see it in attendings that are that old too. I see the same stuff, you know, they're substance abuse problems, marital problems, divorce three times. I mean, it's, not and not in a passing judgment way. It's just mm -hmm. it's it, it's this job is what it is, you know. And so, I, I think it would. I think it definitely takes more work um, in order to kind of normalize that conversation. But I still think it's the same thing because you know one of my attendings who's of that old guard. He when I when I had nursing home rounds the other day and he comes up to me. He's like Bryce. Your stuff, I I he, I followed me on TikTok and I had no idea. Uh -huh. And he's like, "You're yeah. so brave and courageous, and um, yeah. you know, I love your stuff." And he's like, "It's so important that you're saying this stuff." He's like, "And it has helped me so much." And I'm like, "Ooh, okay, good." Yeah. You know, so I am reaching that that yeah. kind of older crowd, I guess. But um, but all I can say is, you know, like I I can't we can't force anybody to do anything, but it's the same thing, you know, it's if you, if you think you even might need some help or you're struggling or you're just not doing okay, whatever steps for you are, are the best ones, right? Talking to a friend, talking to a colleague, talking to a therapist, talking to a physician coach, joining a community like we have on LinkedIn, something like that. You know, it's just, it's, it's so much better to not suffer in silence, you know? And, mm -hmm. and so I, you know, I, I don't know if it's really different for like, you know, an older generation versus new. I think, I think the the mission and the way to get there is the same. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. right, I guess. right. So it's just that you have to be willing if you're struggling to talk to someone. Don't do yeah. it alone because I think doctors think, and I've heard them say, 
that, well, they're doctors, they think they can figure it all out and some yeah. of this, right? So, I mean, yeah. you can speak to that, right? Because you're probably thinking, I'm a smart guy or I was in the military, right? I'm in medical school. Um, why can't I just figure this out? Yeah, I mean, that was my intern year. You know, I'm a new doctor and I'm like, I, 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 you know, I grew up in poverty and now look at me, I'm in medical school, I'm in the, I'm in the Navy, I have this great uniform, you know, I, I, I graduated near the top of my class and, and then I get, I show up to Southern California and I'm like anxious, depressed, mm -hmm. on, I struggling with substance use and, and I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'll figure this out. I figured everything out in my life up mm -hmm. to this point and, Months, days go by, weeks go by, months go by, and I'm getting, it's not getting figured out. Quite, in fact, quite the opposite. And so you start to panic a little bit. You're like, what's going on? Like, how, mm -hmm. why can't I do this? You know, I, I'm a, I'm a doctor. I'm a smart guy, like you just right, said. Right, right. And, um, and, and that's when that's the key moment, right? Is like recognizing, like, whoa, this is way bigger than what I am. And so, and again, if I, if I had recognized that and I didn't have so much like pride, I, man, I, I mean, I'm so thankful for Matt right now. I'm so grateful to even be sitting here with you mm -hmm. and, and every, cause otherwise I never would have. Right. But like, mm -hmm. I've lost a lot of money. I've lost, you know, a lot of sleep and, and things like that for some of the mistakes I've made because I did not reach out for help. You know what I mean? And so, so I'm, a, I'm one of the lucky ones really, but you know, it was a very critical time. And I think if I would have got intervened on like, boom, right there, my life would be very different so you mm -hmm. know just just the thought right right so that's what i have to say is is is, is um to just reach out to anyone talk to somebody whether it's a, a friend a minister a coach and if you don't know a safe person you can trust uh both of us know wonderful right ourselves right wonderful oh, yeah. doctors on um linkedin that yeah. would be happy to have a conversation that would love to support their colleagues yeah and if I can just say real quick, I'll just everyone example, because, you know, like this, this past weekend, like, you know, my LinkedIn, whatever's going on with that, my LinkedIn got shut down. So I got a message from you, Kim and, and Dr. Michael Hirsch. And, and I, I'm, they're like, are you OK? You know, like what's going on? And I, I, I mean, just a wave of, you know, I just I was so happy because like there's people checking in on me. You know, it's it's just so great. And it's like, oh, no, I'm fine. I'm great. Something's going on with my LinkedIn, you know, but it's just like it's just so great to have that community and, 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 you know, just to connect with people because you both about the same exact time reached out to me and it just warmed my heart so much to think that, wow, there's someone that cares about me that much to do that. And that's all it takes sometimes is just someone, someone at the right moment to reach out and just say, Hey, look, if you need something, let me know. Hey, I'm here for you. Hey, I'm concerned about you. And Mm -hmm. you know i'm I'm glad i'm doing great but you know it's yeah, just, yeah, go it ahead. just it was so wonderful that you and dr hirsch did that yeah well i think that's a wonderful and it's beautiful of you to say that and how like linkedin so it's not hokey and we're not joking and exaggerating when you say that linkedin relationships become real relationships they, yeah they do and i know you met like you met dr uh, robert kornfeld you know you heard yeah, some person, of yeah. music and yeah. and and yeah and like i say you are I, i've said it before I, I i this moniker for you i say patient zero it's a person zero it's like everything started with kim downey the nucleus and then everybody's connected there's a there's a way to find your way back it's we all you know all these people all these great people i've met know kim downey and and that's what it's so fun i mean the community yeah. is so great you know we all you start like you, you go on this podcast you do you, you write a piece and you're like oh i know that person oh wait that hey they are they're already on this podcast and it's it's just it's fun it's a lot of fun I, yeah yeah it is and i just love that too and i said recently that i feel like a proud mom like when i did the, yeah. the articles and then i connected everybody with each other and now they're yep. on each other's spot like you're saying and yep. it's like i feel like it's like my kids all getting along right yeah <laughs> like, right i mean you raised <laughs> us and you sent us out into the and world that now yeah, we're doing big it. things and so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really awesome. Um, is there anything else particularly on your heart and mind today that you'd like to talk about? You know, I think, I mean, it, it's funny. I, I, I wake up every, you know, I, like once I get back on LinkedIn and in my blog and my podcast is this, you know, this stuff I'm so on fire about like physician wellness and all that stuff. And I just, you know, I wake up every day and it seems like every day I've got something different on my heart, you know, and so, but I'm I'm passionate about everything, but you know, lately what it's been is, you know, especially for physicians, but everybody in life, you know, if, if you are a healthcare worker, like I said, a physician, a nurse, or, you know, a physical therapist, 
I think it's so important to have something outside of life that really balances you out, right? Because especially in medical school and residency, like we are just ingrained to think that our whole life is medicine and that like, that's all we should do, right? Is study medicine, read medicine, listen to lectures, you know, go home, read up to date and those sorts of things. And then your life outside of it is that, I mean, when I, I burned out the second time at the end of my second year of residency. So not even quite a year ago. And then that's when I got coaching by my coach, Chelsea Turgeon. And that's when things changed for me. I, I, I did some value work. I did a lot of inner work. And then I started blogging. I started podcasting. And, mm -hmm. and then I started finding like, wow, work is not quite as bad because I'm doing all this other stuff I'm so passionate about, right? I've got all this mm -hmm. other stuff on the outside to do it. And because I started doing that stuff, I was better at work. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I was showing up better for patients. My memory was better. My mood was better. I, I was just performing better. So it's kind of counterintuitive at first, but like mm -hmm. ever since I've found this other work and, you know, I'm doing some investing stuff right now, I'm just pumped about a lot of things, you know? And so I, I just encourage it. You know, we got to break down this mantra of like medicine is your life and you work a mm -hmm. hundred hours a week and you go home. Actually, you don't go home. You should just stay at the hospital. It's like, that's right. got to go. You know, we got it. We got to get rid of that. So. Right. Absolutely. Well, just this morning, I interviewed Dr. Mary Long. She's a hematology oncologist. I know her. Yeah. Oh, I, I, okay. I, I talked with her on the phone maybe like a month or two ago. So yeah, I know oh, her. That's what I awesome. mean. Awesome. Okay. Well, and actually, we wanted, she wants to hear Bob Kornfeld's band play as well. So the next yeah. time, so I told Bob he's getting more groupies. He's got yeah. to get, get going. <laughs> Um, but we had a conversation and we were focusing on uh, charting and, you know, and how some doctors are spending a few hours at night uh, charting. So I tried to ask her some very pointed questions about what doctors can actually do to reduce their charting time. And then it's a, it's a resource for them to reach out. Because one thing I know, and I, I've heard doctors say over and over again, exactly what you're saying. It's that once they find something outside medicine, then that helps them get the joy in practicing medicine and that they have even more energy. But if you're in a place of burnout, well, like Dr. Amna Shabir has said, even asking for help is exhausting, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're burnt out right now, you can't really think about those other things. You need to, you know, get help for yourself, right? To clear a little space, take a break, do whatever you need to do, get help. And then once you get a little time to think about these things, then you can start to think about things that would light your fire, right? In other, in other ways. And if you have a passion somewhere else, that doctors have said that over and over that that has fueled their um you know joy of medicine practicing even even today <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I there's two things i want to make a point well three one dr Abna shabir lovely human also coached me as well uh, just an exceptional human being but um yeah, but you I know i want to what, second that i love yeah <laughs> yeah she's great um and it, if you need coaching yeah reach out to her cuz she's wonderful um but i so i think that's a big thing is that sometimes that like when I burned out in my last or last year in residency, I, you know, I, there was a lot of inside pressure with work, but there's a lot of outside pressure with life that was going on. And I was, I was bur burned out. I was jaded. I was cynical. And sometimes, you know, and there's people around me saying, hey, Bryce, like, it doesn't look like you're doing that good. I'm like, whatever, I'm fine. You know, leave me alone. I don't, and then even like my attendings, my program, like, what's going on, you know? So eventually they, I said, I was like, I'm going to leave medicine. Screw it. You know, I was in a bad place, not a good mental, mental place. And it was, thank God for them, because my program director and my now medical director, they took a step back and they said, why don't you just take 12 weeks, you know, or some time off? Let's give you a month yeah. off. And I was like, yeah, whatever. It's not going to change my mind. You know, I'm, and, and then like one week goes by, I'm like, okay, I'm feeling a little better in three weeks. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. So like when there's people around you that love and care about, you start to recognize that I pay attention to that. And also you, it, sometimes you just need some time off and I don't care what job you're in. There is always a recourse to take time off. You know, mm -hmm. in residency, you have 12 weeks of ACGME approved time to take time off. There's FMLA, there's the short-term disability, whatever it is. I promise you it's worth it. Mm -hmm. um, I forget the second point I was going to make, but that's, that's, that's a, that's a, a very important point is that, um, you, you know, taking some time off to kind of to rekindle yourself because you, when you're in that mindset and, and that burn it burned out jaded, it's, it's, you don't want to be making big decisions. I promise mm -hmm. you it's, it's not a good place. 
Right, right. Well, and if you remember that other point, I'll add it to the show notes. Yeah, <laughs> I will. It'll probably come to you in the middle of the night, right? It will. Yep, so, absolutely. Since we were talking about coaches, of course, I have to give my own coach a shout out, Dr. Michael Hirsch. <laughs> we Wonderful can't talk human. about coaches. Yeah, you know? yeah. He's, he's. I mean, yeah, he, 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 you and him are the first two that I connected with on literally like the first two because I, I don't know which one it was first. I think it was you first, yeah, and no, I, I but I also I talked to him. And you're like, you should reach out to him. I'm like, I kind of yeah. did already, but <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. Just grateful for everybody. It's just it's yeah. good times, good times yeah, all yeah. around. Yeah, it's great. So I'm going to take a little side thing here because I have a question. So I know that, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Donna Coriel, and she had um, compiled this book uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Kimberly Green Leibowitz, and I'm going to be interviewing her soon. And her entry was uh, the twist of a, the patient apology. So without getting into details, she shares how there's a lot of literature on doctors apologizing to patients, but not so much about patients apologizing to doctors. So I was just curious if you've ever had any patient apologize to you for anything. Oh, gosh, that's that's a great question. And I know it has been the case, but I typically brush it off because I think that's just how like my training and and what's ingrained in us is that they, you know, it's expected that I do this for you, that if you make a mistake, you don't have to apologize for it. You're the patient, you're vulnerable, you're mm -hmm. coming to me for help. And if you know, if you make a mistake, like, I, I just I don't know. I mean, my patients make mistakes all the time. They do. And and that's okay. You know, I make mistakes all the time, too. Clearly, you know, I have patients on like, very, very, you know, difficult substance use disorder patients. And they're, I'm sorry, you know, I, I, I went back and, you know, it's like, I don't want, I don't even want you to apologize for that, you know? And, mm -hmm. and even like, I mean, I remember on my PDR rotation, there's this mom, this five-year-old who brought her kid in and she's screaming at me because no one can figure out what's going on with her kid. And it hasn't been able to for five years. And she wants me to figure it out, you know? And I, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, she's screaming in my face and, and then later, you know, I walk out of the room and of course I'm a little frustrated, but she apologizes to me later. And I'm like, oh, it's okay. You know, like you're, okay. you're struggling and, and there's something deeper than that i don't think you're just being mean to me for no reason so right. I, I i'm sure they have but i honestly i i don't know if i really have internalized it much not in a bad way i just i get it yeah, you know like yeah. you're you're coming to me at the, probably the most vulnerable time in your life with the most vulnerable information so right it's okay you know? right well and that's a great attitude to have but i know that uh dr michael hirsch has said that it helped him when he started taking in the gratitude instead of, again, just brushing that off. Cause I know that from yeah. my own lived experience. Cause you're like, yeah, I'm just doing my job, but that now he'll, you know, keep his hand on the door. Somebody, if he's walking out the door and somebody, you know, thanks him, he keeps his hand on the door and he really takes a moment to take that in. So I guess you could say the same thing if they're offering a genuine apology, yeah. to really that that can help. And again, it helps with those connections, like really yeah. take the human connections. Yeah. I, and that's, I mean, Dr. Michael Hirsch is great for that. He's, he has that 10,000 foot view. Sometimes he's able to take a step back. And and when I hear stuff like that, I'm like, that's a really good idea, actually, you know, just to mm -hmm. stop. Cause I'm like, go, go, go 20 minute appointments. Got to get out of the room. You apologize. Great. It's fine. Whatever. Got to go, you know? And so mm -hmm. just taking some time and cause Especially, I'll just make this last point. The the thing that's helped me so much more recently at work is that that connection with patients, right? Like doing something like that, like a moment of gratitude. Where do you, you know, what do your kids do? How many kids do you have? Where do you work? Where did you used mm -hmm. to work? Something like that, you know, it's maybe it puts me behind a little bit more. But Stephen Luellis, who I, I know you know too, he, he said this quote, it was, and I don't know if he came up with it, but he's brilliant. So he probably mm -hmm. did, you know, it when you do stuff like that, it can make a five minute appointment feel like a 20 minute appointment. Yep, I and, and then the opposite is true. If you're not doing stuff like that, a 20 minute right. appointment can feel like a five. So right. very important stuff. Right. And I think it's the tiny little things like that. Cause when you guys feel like you don't have control of your schedules, you have the loss of autonomy, but it's those moments to make those relationships they keep it from solely feeling like time to make the donuts, right? Like if yes. they're in and out every 15 minutes, right? It could feel like that for you and us. But if you make that little, can it take the time to make the connection? It can make all the difference in how you feel about what you're doing. Yes. Yep. And it, that's key. It's huge for burnout. Uh, you know, it. I, I sometimes it's hard, like you said, when you don't have that mental reserve to kind of dig down and do that. But if that's the case, then you've got to kind of take a step back and say, okay, well, there's some other steps I may need to take here, including taking time off before I try and engage back in patient care or doing something like that, you know? So mm -hmm. it's hard. I get it. It's super hard. I'm 
I'm, I'm, I'm be, I'll be the first to tell you it's extremely difficult, but it's worth it to, to reach out and get help and, and, and ask for help. So, right. and that's hope and that, right. That's what we're trying to share is a message of hope. Yeah, that's all. I mean, that's all we got. It, you're not in this alone. We're in this together. And I promise you the thoughts you're having, the things you're struggling with, I struggled with it. Just mm -hmm. about everybody else, even though they put on this facade that they aren't struggling with it, right. they have. They're thinking those same things. So it's okay to speak up. It's okay to say, I'm not doing okay. And it could change your life. It really could. It really could. Right. Absolutely. Well, that's a great way to uh, conclude our conversation. So thank you so much, Brace. I'm so happy that we were able to spend this time together. Yes, Kim, thank you for everything. You've been wonderful. I, I can't wait to collaborate more. And and of course, what just what you're doing is great. Everybody agrees with that. So thank you for everything. We appreciate okay. it. And thank you, Brace. The same, same for you, right? You're really helping your colleagues as well. So in closing, to move the needle in healthcare, we all need to raise our voices and we all need to care about each other. We already know that doctors need to care about patients. Patients need to care about doctors too. So stand up doctors and let's stand up for doctors. <laughs>